A zoo is as good a place as any to find out. Paleontologist Bob Bakker. We're here in the uh, National Zoo where they're about to feed fabulous furballs, that is, small mammals, hot blooded animals. And the essence of being hot blooded is eating, eating lots, eating all the time. If you're hot blooded, your body furnace just churns up calories, your dietary chores are just never done, never. Cold bloodedness is a whole different thing. Um, good example a meat eating cat in the wild. Uh, how much does your Jeffrey's cat weigh about? Approximately eight pounds. Eight pounds, okay. Um, total weight of food, you'd offer it? We offer week? between three to five pounds. Three to five, like, uh, okay. Here's five pounds of meat. That's um, a weekly ration for a small carnivorous mammal, small hot blood. Let's exchange the mammal for a lizard now, okay. Cold-blooded lizard on the same diet in the same habitat, a zoo or the wild, you would only need the corner of this. Less than a quarter of a pound. One twentieth as much meat per week for the lizard because it's cold blooded. Warm bloodedness is a wonderful adaptation, but it carries a tremendous price. The price of eating all the time at fabulous rates. The enormous difference in food intake between reptiles and mammals gives Bakker what he needs to test his idea about dinosaurs. Among hot blooded predators, there's a definite ratio of predator to prey. If a predator is hot-blooded, it needs to eat 50 times its own weight a year to stay alive, with the result that among hot-blooded animals, 2% are predators, the rest are prey. A cold-blooded predator, on the other hand, such as a crocodile, needs to eat only five times its own weight a year to survive. So the percentage of predators to prey is higher. When you look at the dinosaurs that have been collected, what percentage are predators? A hot-blooded 2% or a cold-blooded 20%? Well, I'll tell you what the number is. The number is 1 to 3%. 1 to 3% of all the dinosaur tonnage is meat-eater. And that's a hot-blooded number. A hot-blooded reptile? Such a creature exists nowhere else in nature. And yet in one important respect, dinosaurs did indeed behave as though they were hot-blooded. They appear to have traveled great distances. No part of the world we know now was out of bounds to dinosaurs. Their remains turn up everywhere. Hadrosaurs in Japan. Protoceratops in Mongolia. Stegosaurs all the way from Europe to Africa. Huge sauropods everywhere in North and South America. And perhaps most significantly of all, Hadrosaurs and Ceratopsians in Alaska. The North Slope of Alaska, 100 miles above the Arctic Circle. Most of the year it's a frozen wasteland, but for a month in summer, the temperature climbs as high as 40 degrees. A team of scientists has taken advantage of the relatively balmy weather to look for evidence that would help settle the debate over dinosaurs' body temperatures. Let us suppose dinosaurs were hot-blooded. How could they have weathered the climate here? Most dinosaurs had no fur and no feathers to keep them warm. And what would they have eaten? Does anybody want any bagels? Uh, yeah. Much depends on what the Arctic was like at the time, 90 million years ago. The researchers split into two parties. While one crew sets out to look for bones and more clues to the body temperature of dinosaurs, a second group, consisting of paleobotanists Judy Parrish and Bob Spicer, flies 100 miles downriver on the trail of a different quarry, fossil plants. I'll, uh, I'll go and prospect the plants. Okay. Judy Parrish. 
This is an impression of a log that's uh, about 90 million years old. We can see the pattern of the wood. Uh, this may be an impression of the bark here. And uh, we can see that it was a large tree. We know from other samples of trees from this age rock that these trees had very wide growth rings. And what that tells us is that during the growing season, they grew very happily. Uh, tree rings have got usually light and dark bands. The light band is laid down when the tree is growing during the summer, and the dark band is laid down in the fall if the uh, growing season has a cool part to it. These trees don't have a dark band, or they have a very, very thin dark band, and that shows that they were growing very rapidly during the growing season and then stopped abruptly. And from the fossil leaves, Spicer and Parrish can deduce what the weather was like. Here in prehistoric Alaska, the temperature averaged about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But could dinosaurs have survived in such a climate? One answer is visible right here, only a hundred miles away, where the other party has been working. Over 1,000 dinosaur bones have been collected on this slope in the last 10 years. Paleontologist Andy Crumhart. This is the very bottom of the bone bed, and as you can see, there's just piles and piles of bones just all jammed together. It started, I hit this little tip of a bone right here. This is a scapula, that's your shoulder blade bone right here, the young individual. And in taking that out, I ran into bone on either side. There's a long fibula bone right here, which is a leg bone. There's a rib here, um, an arm bone here. I think another arm bone here, which is pretty well destroyed. It's, it's not in very good condition. It's gonna continue underneath me and continue that way, and I'm gonna have to take out some of the side here and some of this back here um, to probably finish it off. And no doubt, it goes back into the bank as well. So in the summer, at least, dinosaurs were plentiful here and would have had enough sun and food to survive. The climate might have been no more severe than fall in Maine. But what about the winter, when the sun would shine as little as four hours a day? What did the dinosaurs do? Did they hibernate? If I was a dinosaur, I wouldn't want to stay up here during the winter. Three months of darkness and temperatures probably falling down to around about freezing point. So, like many modern caribou, for example, I think that the dinosaurs probably migrated. Probably in large herds, maybe hundreds or thousands at a time, moving north in the spring, following the, the spring flush of growth, spending the summer on the Arctic slope where Lots of food was to be had, and the daylight was constant. And then as the, the year waned and the winter came on, moving south again, following the food resources. Migrating herds of hadrosaurs and pachyrhinos would seem a strong argument for the hot-blooded dinosaur. It doesn't seem possible that a cold-blooded animal could muster the sustained energy to make a journey of hundreds of miles in almost freezing weather. But maybe they could. Dragon 2, this is Dragon 1. Dragon 2, this is Dragon 1. Come in, please. Tamarindo on Costa Rica's Pacific coast. 